So in this video, we're going to talk about the parallel axis theorem, which is an equation to find the moment of inertia for something when it is not rotating around its center of mass. To show this equation, we're going to take a look at two situations that you've hopefully already dealt with. A rod that's rotating around its center of mass, where you know it pivots around its center, so maybe like a propeller or if you threw um, a stick in the air, something like that, versus a rod when it is rotating about its end. So this could be like if you were holding the end of a baseball bat or if you were looking at the minute hand or hour hand on a clock that was going around in a circle. And we've already shown um, using integral calculus in another video how to come up with these moments of inertia or these values of i. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to take the moment of inertia for the rod about its end, one-third ml squared, and we're going to take away the moment of inertia, one-twelfth ml squared, to see if we can find some missing piece that lets us understand how we went from this moment of inertia about the center of mass to this moment of inertia um, where we have a new pivot point. So let's do that. If we're going to try and figure out what this number is, then we need to convert this into twelfths. So one third is really four twelfths. And when you subtract one twelfth, well, we got ml squared, ml squared, you are going to get three twelfths ml squared. And now I'm going to do something a little bit weird. I'm going to turn this into 3 over 3 times 1 over 4 ml squared. And I'm actually going to put this 1 fourth, right, because 3 over 3 is just 1. So we got 1. I'm going to put this 1 fourth inside of the square. So we have ml over 2. Okay, so take a second to make sure that you understand, at least mathematically, how we got to this point m l over 2 the whole thing squared so let's talk about what this is and why it's important for the parallel axis theorem l over 2 happens to be exactly how far away our new pivot point is from the center of mass and in fact the way the parallel axis theorem works out um, is that no matter what two objects you you take if you work backwards you will always find that the product of mass the total mass of the object times this guy right here, which we're going to call this d, the distance of the new pivot from the center of mass. We can call that d. This little bit right here is always what you will be left with. So we can write an equation from this where the new uh, moment of inertia that you want, we'll call that i p for, we'll say, a parallel axis. Notice that the axis of rotation is parallel to it, is always going to be equal to the moment of inertia at the center of mass plus this little bit right here, m d squared. This is one of the most important equations that you can memorize for the AP test because it's not on your equation sheet and it's super useful. All right, let's see how to use this in various types of problems. Let's say you have the toilet paper problem where you drop a roll of toilet paper and maybe you need to figure out, you know, how much time it's going to fall down to the ground or whatever. But in this problem, what we're going to do is we are going to find for this toilet paper that has a radius of r and a mass of m, we're going to find the acceleration. We're going to find the acceleration. Now, to do this, we're going to need to think about the forces that are acting on this object. There are only two. The weight force, down, mg, and then some tension in this rope, which we'll call t. And of course, these are separated far by the radius r. Now, if I was going to try and do the net force to figure out what this problem was, I would have a really difficult time trying to figure this out because effectively, I'm going to get t minus mg equals m a, but I don't know what the tension is. And there's no real easy way for me to figure out what the tension is. So instead, the correct approach would be to think about the net torque. Now, if I was going to add the net torque, I need to pick one point to be the pivot. If I chose the center, to be the pivot, which is the first obvious choice, then the weight would not cause a torque because it's at a radius of zero, and instead only the tension at a radius of r would cause any torque. 
and then I would need to set this equal to I alpha. But the problem with this is that if I try to use this to figure out what the acceleration was, I still don't know what the tension is. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use the parallel axis theorem, where instead of choosing the center, which is the obvious point of rotation, we're going to pick the application of the tension. Now if we do that, no torque is caused by the tension because it has a radius of zero. And instead, the weight force is going to cause a torque at a radius of r. So we would write mgr equals. And we can set that torque equal to I alpha. But now because we're using this new point of rotation, the point of rotation is not about the center of mass, we need to find IP, the moment of inertia at our, you know, our pivot point. And we'll use the parallel axis theorem to find that. Now for this problem, assuming that it's just a disk, we can use I equals one half uh, m r squared, which is what we're going to use. So one half m r squared. Okay, then we're going to add m d, where d we need to figure out is the distance from the center of mass to the new point of rotation, which it works out well for us that that is actually just the radius r. So we can just write m r squared. So one half m r squared plus m r squared, or you know, two over two m r squared gives us three halves m r squared. So that's my new moment of inertia to use for i. So I've got m g r equals three halves m r squared. And now we do the usual thing that we do with alpha where we know alpha times the radius, we'll use capital R for this, is equal to a, or I could write this as alpha equals a over r and substitute so I get a over r. And hopefully you see the, the common thing that happens with torques where we can get rid of this radius and then we can get rid of this radius. So what we're left with is mg, oh actually you know what, we can even get rid of the mass. What we're left with is g equals 3 halves a, or we could write that as the acceleration is 2 thirds, oh well, that's a terrible 3, 2 thirds of the acceleration due to gravity. So that would be the acceleration of the toilet paper. All right, now let's take a look at a ball rolling down an inclined plane. Um, this is going to be a you know normal basketball, so let's just call this a thin spherical shell. And the moment of inertia for a thin spherical shell is 2 thirds m r squared. Okay, now if I wanted to find, say, the acceleration of the ball as it rolled down the inclined plane, it wouldn't be g sine theta, which you might expect. It's going to be some, you know, fraction or variant of it. Here's how we, we figure out what it is. There are going to be two forces acting on this object. One, here I'll get rid of the lines, one is the weight force, mg, located at the center of mass. The other is a frictional force that actually acts up the ramp and keeps it from sliding down. If this was sliding instead of rolling, then you would see that the ball slides down the ramp and there's no friction. The third force that would be present would be a normal force, which we would normally draw, huh, that's funny, from, you know, the actual point of contact, but I'm actually going to just draw it on the center of the mass, call that the normal force, so that we have a little bit of room to, to see the radius r that's in between friction and the weight. All right, so here's the deal. The weight force causes a torque and rotates the ball down the ramp. The friction also causes a torque um, that, you know, basically acts against the ball. And that friction force doesn't lift the ball up the ramp. It just acts against the weight so that a rolling motion begins. It would be kind of an obvious thing to choose the center as the point of rotation. But if you choose the center as the point of rotation, then you are going to need to try and figure out, let's write this out, center torque. If you choose the center as the point of rotation, then you're going to try and need to figure out what the torque caused by friction times the radius is. But the likelihood of you being able to say what the force of friction is in this problem, it, well, it's just not likely. So instead what we're going to do 
is we are going to think about the net torque as being relevant to the point of rotation or the pivot actually at the application of the frictional force. Now the reason why we choose that as our point of rotation instead is we don't need to worry about friction causing a torque because it's at a radius of zero from the point of rotation. Instead, we have a component of the weight that is going to cause a torque. Now not all of this weight force will cause a torque. The angle theta of the incline, if you can imagine you've got a component here and a component here. Or instead, if you prefer, we could draw those on the other side. Component here and a component here. Then theta belongs on that point, which is kind of hard to see, but it's right there. And it hopefully you can see that this point right here, which is adjacent, that would be mg cosine. And then this guy right here is mg sine theta. Hopefully you can see that the component of the force that actually applies a torque isn't mg cosine theta because that force is parallel to the radius, but instead mg sine theta causes that torque. And so what we can do is we can say that mg sine theta times the radius r is our torque and set that equal to i where it's now relevant to our point of rotation p. Uh, times alpha. Now to figure out what IP is, we use the moment of inertia at the center of mass plus MD squared, which in this problem D is just R again. It's really easy. So we would write 2 thirds MR squared plus MR squared or uh, 5 thirds MR squared is our new moment of inertia. So 5 thirds MR squared times alpha, which we're going to replace alpha just like we did before with A over R. So A over R. And then all this is going to be equal to mg sine theta times R. That is not A12. All right, we'll get rid of the R's. And then we'll get rid of, oops, sorry, not G, M. And we're going to find that the acceleration g sine theta equals 5 thirds times a. We're going to find that the acceleration is simply 3 fifths of g sine theta. So it wound up not being g sine theta, but slightly less because of the fact that the object was rolling. You did a great job. Congratulations. Yay, you're so good at physics.